<laughs> oh, hi! Hello, everyone! Uh, welcome to our Once Enterprise webinar. Uh, my name is Konstantin, and today I will show you how to develop business applications using the Once Enterprise platform, the development framework of a new generation that we absolutely love here at Once International. It gives you unprecedented functionality, flexibility, and most importantly, the development speed. So uh, this is what we're going to do. I will share my screen with you guys and start developing a relatively simple application in real time. Of course, I will explain what exactly I do and why, how every particular feature works, etc. This will take us about 20-30 minutes and I promise you will be surprised by how much can be done in such a short time if you use the Once Enterprise platform. What I expect you to do is to text your questions uh, down in the Zoom chat section as we go. And as soon as I'm done with the application, I will take as much time as needed to answer all of them. What kind of an application we're gonna build today? Uh, so the story behind it is uh, that I own a small convenience store in Vancouver downtown, which I honestly don't. And I also have some software development experience. This one I do have. So I decided to build an app that will help my small imaginary business to operate, to grow, to make me rich, you know, stuff like that. So this is our task for today. Just one more thing before we get started. This entire webinar is based on our brand new online training course. The course is absolutely free of charge, 100% organic, gluten-free. In other words, it's good for you, so go and check it out. So let's get started, shall we? Okay, let me switch uh, the view, run the platform, and it asks if I want to create an infobase. So the infobase is basically a very specifically structured database that stores both the application and the data created by users. Here is the link for you to get more in-depth information. If the application lives in the infobase, we need to create one before we start developing anything. So the answer is yes, please. Create a new infobase. This is where I would see any third-party uh, applications installed on my computer, if I had any. But now I want to build the application from scratch. So I just click Next, give the application name Convenience, Next. Uh, let's rename the folder uh, the infobase lives in. Next. Uh, leaving these settings by default and finish. And our infobase is now all set and ready to roll. Now, to start developing the application, I need to open the infobase with a designer. Like this. And here we go. This is where the application leaves, and I want to start with renaming it. I'm opening the application properties and changing the name to convenience like this. Okay, now, what are these things in the application tree? These are called metadata classes. And here is a link for you to learn more about what they are. What's important to note right now is that every metadata class is built to solve a very specific task. It has a data structure, behavior, and UI UX best fit to the task. When we build an app, we create instances of these classes, which are called metadata objects. A metadata object inherits its uh, data structure and behavior from the metadata class it belongs to. But we can change it to some extent. By extending the object's data structure, by redefining its default UX UI, and by writing some code that modifies its behavior. But we need to remember that metadata classes are not interchangeable. Each class has its purpose, and we don't want to use, for example, an accumulation register instead of a catalog. It just won't work. So one of our responsibilities as 1C application developers is to know what each metadata class is aimed at and use it appropriately. And we have the entire module dedicated to this subject alone. So don't skip it when you take the course. 
Okay, so let's think what metadata objects we need for our convenience application. First of all, we need a list of products we sell. This is what we use catalogs for, and this is where I explain why. So I'm renaming the catalog to products, and this is where we can define the data structure for the object. As you can see, every catalog already has the code and description attributes. The only thing I would change here is the description length. Now, what other attributes we might need? My idea is to have the catalog that lists all products I know about, regardless of whether I have them on shelves or not, how many of them, etc. So here I want attributes like the brand of the product and stuff like that. So I'm adding a new brand attribute and now I need to decide what type it is. There is a bunch of options including the string type, which might work unless I wanted to reuse the same brands for different products which I do, so I need to list uh, the brands in another catalog. So I'm creating it like this, and now I can go there and set the brand attribute type to the brand's catalog reference. Okay, let's run the app and see what we've got here. These are our brands, so let's add a couple of those. And now I can start filling out the products list, like this. Okay, now I just recall that I have a locksmith counter in my imaginary shop, so I need some services in my products list. But the brand field doesn't make any sense for them. So I need two things. I need to tell the product from service and I need to hide the brand field for all services. Okay, let's do it. So I'm adding a new attribute to the products catalog and the question is what type should it have? Well, I need a list with two records, product and service. And I don't want users to change this list in any way. This is where we use the enumerations, a fixed list of values. And up there is the link to the episode about these guys. So I'm creating a new enumeration, naming it product types. And these are the values I want in the list. Okay, let's set up this enumeration reference as the type for this field. And now the only thing we have left to do is hiding or unhiding the brand field in the catalog item form. This is uh, the catalog form list. And it's empty, as you can see. But wait a second. Where did this form come from then? Or this form? So here is the deal. This metadata object belongs to the catalogs metadata class that defines default UX UI for all the catalogs you create. This includes the list form, the single item form, etc. If I need to change the default form, I can create an explicit copy of platform's default form, like this, and then modify it the way I like. This window we are now in is called the form editor, and here is a link for you to learn more about this guy. What I want to do here is to remove the code field, which I don't use, and move the product type field to the very top of the form. Now I need to hide the brand field depending on the product type value. This will require some coding, which in one enterprise always starts with event handlers. The first event we need to handle is generated by the form when it gets created on the server side. I'm creating this handler like this, and this is what I write here. Which means, whenever the form gets open, check if the product type field value is equal to service, and if it is, make the brand field invisible. Besides that, I need to hide or show the brand field when the product type field value gets changed. So I'm creating a handler, and here I need to call the server function, because enumeration values are not accessible on the client side. 
So this is what I type here. And now I need to check the product type value against uh, the enumeration in a server side function like this. Okay, let's check if it works. So uh, this is uh, the form we just modified. I'm setting the product type to service and the brand field is gone. I'm saving the product and reopen it like this. And there is no brand field in the form. Changing it back to product and the brand field is back. Now let's register some sales, shall we? To register any kind of business transaction in one scene enterprise, we use documents. So let's create one and call it sales. What kind of data do we need this document to store? Well, I could use a payment method attribute that would store as a reference to another enumeration called payment methods like this. And let's not forget to fill the enumeration, which I almost did. So I'm fixing it like this. And I also need a list of products sold, basically a table living inside of each single document. These sort of things are done in one's enterprise using so-called tabular sections. Let me show you. I'm creating a new table calling it products and then adding attributes. The product attribute storing a reference to the products catalog. The quantity attribute to tell the amount sold. And the price attribute to tell, well, the price. Okay, let's see what it looks like. Uh, this is our sales document. I'm creating a new one, setting up the payment methods, filling out the products list. And here we go, our first sale transaction is registered. The one thing I'm missing here is the total sum across all the products in the document. So let's fix it. I'm creating an explicit document form like this and opening the object attribute of the form. Uh, this attribute is basically a form's a local copy of the document we are editing right now. So here is the payment method attribute and this is our product list, which have all attributes we added, as well as aggregated values for all numeric attributes. These aggregates were added by the platform automatically because it thought we might need it. So, I'm just grabbing the summed up price and dropping it to the form like this. And down here it goes. And by the way, while we are here, uh, let's also show the product brand in the table, which is done as easy as this. It's actually pretty cool if you think about it. The brand attribute doesn't even live in the sales document. But we just asked the platform to get the brand by its reference and display it on the form. And this will work for any reference to any depth, so we can go on and on opening reference like tree notes and taking what we need. So this is our sales document form, but I also need a total price in the sales document list. So let's create this list form too. Okay, what do we have here in the form attributes? This is the product list, but there is no aggregates down there. No aggregates, no problem, let's implement it ourselves. There is more than one way of doing this, but I'll show you my personal favorite one. First of all, I'm adding a new attribute to the document's data structure. Let's call it a total price. Here is uh, the new attribute in the forms data and I'm just dropping it to the form like this. Now I need to save the total price in this new attribute. 
let's go back to the document form. And here is the event that gets triggered when a user saves the document to the database. So let's create its handler. And this is what I write here. Let me explain what I did. I just took the total calculated by the form automatically and copied its value to the document attribute I created. Okay, let's check what we've got. This is our sales document and this is uh, the total amount paid. I'm saving it and here is the same total amount in the list. Okay, now to sell something, you need to buy it first, am I right? So let me just clone the sales document like this, rename it to purchases, and add a company attribute, which I'm gonna use to refer to a supplier I made each purchase from. I'm going to store the supplier list in yet another catalog called companies, changing this attribute type to this new catalog reference, and that's it. So now I can start registering how many things I've bought as well as how many things I've sold. How about how many things I have left? This is the task we use accumulation registers for. Let me show you. So I'm creating a new accumulation register, calling it inventory, and going to the data tab. And as you can see, it already looks pretty different from what we've seen in catalogs and documents. Besides attributes, we already know. There are some new types of fields, dimensions and resources. If you are familiar with the SQL syntax, uh, this example will help you to understand how it works. When we write data to the accumulation register, it aggregates resources, grouping them by dimensions, as if it was running something like this kind of a SQL query. I want our register to aggregate the quantity of the products, so I am creating a resource for that and I want this quantity to be broken down by product. So I'm creating a dimension for the product's reference. Now I need my documents to start writing data to the register. This process is called posting, and this is how it's set up. I'm starting with the purchase document. This is where the posting settings live. I'm telling the platform uh, that purchase documents write their data to the inventory register like this and running the wizard to help me with the rest. I want the purchase document to increase the product balance, so uh, this is the operation type I need. Now I'm selecting the document's tabular part like this, and the only thing left to do is to tell the platform what document's attribute goes where. But I can also ask the platform to guess, then click OK, and here is what the wizard did. It wrote the code for the posting event handler that is to be triggered every time we post a purchase document. This code will create a new register record for every product in the document's tabular section, copy the product catalog reference to the register product dimension, and its quantity to the register's quantity resource. Okay, let's now do the same for the sales document. except for the operation type, that will tell the register to subtract from the balance rather than add into it. All the other settings are pretty much the same, and now I need some place to check how much products I have left. There are many ways of showing the accumulation register balance, but I'm gonna take this chance to show you how the Once Enterprise reports work. Let's create a new report called Inventory Balance, and this is where the main report settings live. This is how we tell the report where to take the data from. We can run a query to grab data from our own infobase, or we can collect data from elsewhere, other databases, not necessarily 1C-based, SOAP and REST web services, etc. And using this union thingy, we can build complex tree-like structures combining many different datasets together. For our report, we need data from the infobase, so I'm selecting a query here, and uh, this is where we can start writing a query text, using the Once Enterprise query language. It's a SQL-based language that fully supports uh, the select statement syntax, including joins, group bys, nested loops, etc. You can use any of these DBMSs to store your infobase. And when you run a 1C query, the platform 
translates it to the specific DBMS SQL dialect and runs it directly on the database server. Not fluent in SQL? Don't worry, the platform got you covered. Just click this Query Builder button right here, and now you can build complex queries without knowing much about SQL syntax. Let me show you. So this is our inventory register balance table. This is how I tell the query that I want data from this table, specifically from these fields. I also want the report to be sorted by product name, so I'm doing this. And that's it. This is our query text, and now I go here to tell the report how it should look like. I'm gonna keep things simple and add the only report section and tell the report what fields I want to be displayed. And that's it. All right, let's run it and see how it all works. First of all, let's buy some groceries from my favorite supplier. On my business credit card. I'm gonna need some Coke Zero. Some iced tea. And some chips. And here we go. Now let's check the inventory balance and these are groceries we just bought. Now let's sell some of them. And how does our inventory balance feel? Got changed correspondingly. Perfect. Now, uh, what if I want to change uh, the report functionality? Can I do that? Of course I can. But what's even more interesting, users can too. Let me show you. I'm going here, and these are all kinds of settings available to users at runtime. If you know what you are doing, you can change literally everything. Add the new report section, set up a filter, change the sort order, highlight the report data depending on any conditions, and so much more. Let's, for example, set up a filter by products. I'm going here, dropping the product field to the list of filters, telling the report that I want to be able to choose several products at once, and placing this filter settings to the report form, like this. Finish editing. And this is my new report. Let me set the filter like this. And this is the report with the filter applied. Now I can save my version of the report like this. And this is where I can choose between the default report and my version of it. This incredible runtime flexibility applies to the entire UI all over the application. I can change uh, the main window layout, as well as any form, just like this. And the best part? This application will work on any operating system, and in any web browser. What does it take to make the application available over the internet? Let me show you. Administration, publish, and that's it. Now I can just open the browser and run my application just like this. And as you can see, it looks and feels exactly the same. And by the way, you can check it out yourself right now using this address. Okay, that's all I wanted to show you today. Of course, it's just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many more awesome things the platform can do for you, and the best place to get to know them is our online course I already mentioned. So go and check it out for yourself, and join our developers community. And now let's get to your questions.